You know you got a, a good church family when you have so much fun talking to people on Sunday morning that you're not ready to come up to the pulpit after Hunter quit, uh, stops playing. So uh, well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to University Baptist Church uh, this Sunday morning. It's a, a blessing to be with you today, and, uh, and it's a special day. Uh, today is a uh, time at UBC where we recognize uh, uh, parents and children uh, and uh, invite some to come forward and uh, dedicate them to um, learning about Jesus and uh, doing so here at UBC uh, and and dedicate those parents um, to to this place and those children to this place and all toward that wonderful purpose. So I'm excited to share that with you all this morning. My very first parent-child dedication here at, at UBC. So uh, it's going to be a very special day uh, for for all of us and excited that you can join. Um, and we invite you now just to, to take a moment. Uh, I know that we all come from uh, busy weeks, lots of things going on, hopefully a lot of good things for you. Um, but whether they have been good, whether they have been tough, whether they have been stressful uh, or tragic or triumphant, um, God has been in them and God has brought you here and God is here. So let us take a moment to breathe deeply, to center ourselves, and to join the God who is present. Let us join together in our spoken call to worship. Please respond in the bold type. May God show us his favor and bless us. May he smile on us. Let the nations thank you, O God. Let all the nations thank you. Let the nations thank you, O God. Let all the nations thank you. That the earth yields its crops. May God, our God, bless us. May God bless us. Then in all the earth, the earth will give God the honor.
Becca, Kim, and I, Joseph. And uh, Lily is the youngest of three, or excuse me, four sisters. Can you believe that? Four girls in this family. Can you believe that? Four girls in this family. So they say they're done. They say <laughs> that they're done. And so you have such a blessing, Lily, of growing up with three big sisters who love you and care for you so much, obviously, as we hear even now. So we are grateful that you are here uh, and that you get to be that wonderful four sister who, who we get to know and love along with those other three. And then, of course, we have uh, Mr. Mick Maloney, right? Yeah, it's good to see you, my man. And uh, Mick is the first uh, child of Marty and Kim Maloney here, who we know and love. And uh, Mick, I've heard, is, is on his uh, second outfit for the day, or, or his mom is on her second outfit for the day. And grandma. And grandma on her second outfit. So Mick has marked his territory well. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we, we love and are grateful for you being here with us as well, buddy. And then there's Atticus. Hey, Atticus Mears, dude, we're loving. I mean, look at you, a guy after my own heart with the bow tie this morning. You are looking so wonderful. Uh, and of course, your mommy, uh, Miss Nicole, and uh, daddy, Mr. Michael. And um, we're just excited to have you with us. And a lot of you have heard Atticus before because he offers wonderful commentary on the sermons uh, many weeks. And uh, often he's there to fact check me and, um, and correct me uh, when necessary. So I thank you for that. And he's an active church member already. Uh, and of course, we have Miss Ivy Hargrave and her mommy and daddy, Michelle and Ricky. And she is wearing a special dress. That, can I tell them about your dress this morning, Miss Ivy? That dress is a dress that her mommy wore and that I heard her grandmommy made for her mommy. It's got the three bears on it, and I see a little house, and I think there's Goldilocks in there maybe even eating some porridge. <laughs> so um, I asked what Miss Ivy likes to do, and it's that she likes to uh, play with uh, Big Brother's toys, right? <laughs> And I'm sure you share them willingly, don't you? Yeah, of course. <laughs> and then we've got Miss Iris Webke. Oh, and another. What are the chances of having two beautiful red-headed little children in, in one group of five? I think that's, that's pretty amazing. And what a lovely dress she's wearing today. And uh, we're grateful for her mommy, Michelle, uh, and, and daddy, who's late. She pointed that out, not me. Um, <laughs> So we uh, uh, are grateful for Mr. Jeff as well. Um, but I, I asked what uh, Miss Iris likes to do, and uh, she also likes to play with Big Brother's toys, don't you? You do? Yeah. All of nine months old, is that right? Yeah. Well, we're excited to, to have you, and uh, we'll have to get you and Mr. Mick together for some 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 cool um, auburn haired photos that would really be really be special um, we truly are grateful for you parents and for uh, your children and for um, the the desire that you have to um, grow them up uh, in the way of Jesus and that uh, you uh, you want to do that here at, at UBC and that you let us participate in that journey of faith for them. Uh, that, that's truly a gift and not something that we take lightly. Um, one of the most sacred texts for the Hebrew people uh, that we read about in the Bible is Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 7 uh, and, and 9. Hey, Jeff, how's it going? <laughs> um, there we read, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all of your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And then Jesus famously added in his uh, greatest commandment in Matthew uh, that he said in addition to loving God with all that you are 
you are to love your neighbor as yourself. And so, parents, it is in the spirit of this command that I ask you now, do you, the parents of Ivy and Lily and Kim and Mick and Atticus and Iris, promise to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might and to likewise love your neighbor as yourself? Do you promise to live your lives as individuals and as couples in a way that your child might see your love for God, for them, for one another, and for the world? Will you be responsible for seeing that your child is brought up in the way of Jesus? Will you tell them about Christ through your words and model for them Christ through your actions? Will you, by your prayers and witness, help your child to grow and look like Jesus and become the people God lovingly created them to be? Friends and family, these parents have expressed their trust in God and in you, the body of Christ gathered here by presenting these children for dedication. Will you pledge your support and loving presence in times of ease and difficulty, in times of joy and sorrow, in times of growth and frustration? Will you pledge to be faithful witnesses for Christ in upholding these families and especially these little ones we celebrate today? If so, respond by saying, we will. Ivy, Lily, Kim, Mick, Atticus, and Iris, I join with your parents, your family, and these many gathered friends in making these promises to God and to you. We love you, and we care about you and who you are, just as Jesus loves and cares for you. We are grateful that you are a part of us and dedicate ourselves to showing you the love of Jesus, just as your parents have dedicated you this morning. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us pray. O God, you have taught us through your blessed Son that whoever receives a little child in the name of Christ receives Christ himself. We give you thanks for the blessing you have bestowed upon these families in giving them these children. Confirm their joy by a lively sense of your presence with them and give them calm strength and patient wisdom as they seek to bring their little ones to love all that is true and noble, just and pure, lovable and gracious, excellent and admirable, following the example of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you all.
Please bow with me for the morning prayer. Summoning Lord, obeying your call seems very difficult when all around us seems to be in turmoil. We want to follow and share, but we find the pull in other directions, pushing us to make difficult decisions about our time. May we be more like Paul, ready to take up your calls in a last minute vision. May you again speak to us like that, sending us from our dull lives to great adventures for others. Forgive our not seeing the truth that you are bidding us daily to just follow and share in our lives. And may we, like Lydia, become a true believer, embracing that call, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The New Testament lesson today is from Acts 16, 11 through 15. We therefore set sail from Trohas and took a straight course to Samothrace the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city for some days. On the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate by the river where we supposed there was a place of prayer, 
and we sat down and spoke to the woman who had gathered there, the women, sorry. A certain woman named Lydia, a worshiper of God, was listening to us. She was from the city of Thy Thyatira and a dealer in purple cloth. The Lord opened her heart to listen eagerly to what was said by Paul. When she and her household were baptized, she urged us, saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come and stay at my home. And she prevailed upon us. The word of God for the people of God. How many people out there love their names? How many of you are glad to be named what your name? All right, I'm not gonna ask the folks who don't, didn't raise their hands. Um, I love your names. I love my name. Uh, I always have. I love being a Paul, but if I'm being honest, sometimes it's a little bit heavy uh, because there have been many Pauls in history who have stewarded the name so remarkably that it leaves we who follow feeling small, standing in the canyon-like imprint of the big shoes that they once filled. My grandfather, Paul Burgess, the, well, not the original, but one of them. Uh, you won't read about him in history books necessarily, but you also aren't gonna find a better person, a better father, husband, citizen, or friend in any of those books than him. And he's just one of the many laudable Pauls. Laudable Pauls. Uh, there's Paul McCartney. There's Paul Revere. There's Paul the Apostle, the famed greatest enemy of our faith who would become its greatest champion. It's easy to identify the great names of history and shower them with the praise that they're certainly due. But it's tragically less common that we take time to identify and shower praise upon the names behind those names. There are names, people behind uh, the, the, the names in history, the people who made all those Pauls Paul, right? Behind Paul Bur Burgess, there was his wife, Doris, my grandma. Paul McCartney had Linda. Paul Revere had Mrs. Revere. <laughs> The Apostle Paul, he didn't have a wife, but he did have a ton of people without whom he would never have become the person he became, the most famous and consequential Paul in all of history. And it's easy to forget that, to forget the names behind the names who carry the weight of the world's attention. And thus it's easy if you carry one of those forgotten names to feel forgotten. Overlook, which is why I'm grateful that our Bible takes the time to remark on those who might otherwise feel unremarkable, the names behind the names, the names like Lydia, to whom Luke gives attention in our text this morning. Now, when I was looking at the lectionary passages this week, um, there were several that were maybe more... Uh, well known that that maybe stuck out a bit but i was just i was drawn to this one uh, because i think it's great that luke sheds attention to just one of these folks who otherwise might never have gotten called out in history but but is who who is representative of the so many people who help our faith become what it is um, lydia uh, was just one among the sea of individuals who helped build a legacy we sometimes short-sightedly attribute only to Paul himself. And she proves that no matter how big the footprints we leave are, they matter, they make a difference. Granted, many in Luke's day might not have thought that. They might have looked at Lydia and seen nothing too remarkable. For one, she was a woman and sadly back then, that fact was reason alone to dismiss her potential for remarkability. Also, she didn't serve a particularly spiritual role like Paul or any of the other apostles that you know we, we read about all throughout our Bible. On the surface, she might have seemed kind of regular to folks back then, just another person in the pew. But if we look closely at Lydia's life, we'll see just how remarkable 
She really was in the community, in the church, and in the life of Paul. And thus, through her, maybe we'll also see just how remarkable we all are in this great story that God is telling, no matter what our name may be. Uh, one of the things that Lydia shows us, for example, is that there's no such thing as an ordinary job. Because Luke tells us that Lydia's job was profoundly practical. Right? She was a dyer. She took cloth that was one color and she made it another color. Uh, see, the water in the area where she lived was so perfectly adapted for dyeing that Lydia was able to use it to make this beautiful purple color. So that's how she made her living. So again, very practical, very secular. One might be tempted to say even insignificant. But one would be wrong. Because Lydia's uh, practical job served a very spiritual purpose. It brought her in contact with Paul and Silas. And it provided her with the means to support them. Perhaps because his life was so palatable, we have this vision of Paul that he was a superhero, right? Operating on a separate spiritual plane than the rest of every, than everybody else, flying high above where he had so much to offer us, but we really didn't have anything that we could do for him. But that simply wasn't the case. Paul needed people for his ministry to survive. Paul was spreading his spiritual message in a physical world, and he needed people, ordinary flesh and blood, garment-dying people to make that happen, to pay for his travel, to provide him with shelter, to spread his message. In a lot of ways, Paul was less an independent superhero and more like a jobless college graduate, mooching off of mom and dad and hitting up friends for cash to fund the startup that he swears is going to be big if you guys just invest now, right? You know, sadly, in our Christian world, we have a tendency to grant greater legitimacy to the holy jobs, the Pauls out there, the ministers, the missionaries, the theologians, the authors who peddle in the stuff of holiness. But when we do that, we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg. We're ignoring the fact that God works on every level, in every profession, and has a purpose for every person to help cultivate an environment in which the more overtly spiritual jobs have any chance of success. I remember when I first felt a call to ministry. It was the summer of my sophomore year in high school at Hatch Auditorium at Fort Caswell down at the beach, uh, and it was overwhelming. I was exhilarated. I was thrilled. I was on top of the world for about 15 minutes. And then fear started to think, sink in. And I thought, oh, no. Now my whole life is planned out. Uh, I, I, I'm going to be a pastor, so I can't misbehave any. Uh, I got to go to this type of college. Uh, I got to marry this type of girl. And I can't take wake in, weekend vacations to the beach anymore because I have to be in church every Sunday for the rest of my life. It's a lot for a 16-year-old kid to, to wrestle with. So I spent the next few days in existential purgatory, not wanting to be Jonah and run from God, but feeling ill-equipped to be Jesus until my mom suggested that I call my youth minister, Becky. And so I did. I expressed to her my crippling angst. And she said to me, Paul, it, it's okay. Just because you feel called to ministry doesn't mean that you have to be one type of minister. We are all supposed to be ministers, especially us good Baptists who believe in the priesthood of all believers. So really, you can be a minister as a teacher or as a businessman or, or whatever you feel that God has made you to be. And that made me feel a lot better. It gave me gra the grace and the freedom to explore my calling in a variety of ways. And Lydia proves that what Becky told me was true. She was a minister to Paul and Silas, even through her non-ministerial job which demonstrates uh, another remarkable thing about Lydia, which is her hospitality. Because see, I might have undersold Lydia's success at her ordinary job thus far. See, Lydia wasn't just making it by, Lydia was making it rain, as the kids say. Uh, Lydia was making bank. Lydia was making a lot of money, is essentially what I'm trying to say. 
Uh, see, I said that Lydia was a dyer, but she trafficked in a very exclusive type of dyeing. That purple color she specialized in was actually very rare. In fact, it was uh, one of her city's signature characteristics. They were famous for that purple color, and it put them on the map. Much like my hometown of Smithville is famous for those deliciously dyed, gorgeous, scarlet red hot dogs. Mm -hmm. You can't get those just anywhere. We need more of them up here in Chapel Hill. I'm working on it. Uh, so Lydia was kind of a boss, right? Notice how we don't hear anything about her having a husband. We don't know whether she did or she didn't, but either way, it didn't mention because she didn't need one. Kind of like Oprah with old Stedman, right? We don't hear a lot about Stedman because she don't need him. Um, <laughs> How do we know this about Lydia? Well, in addition to the lucrative nature of her possess, uh, profession, we know that Lydia had a sizable household, large enough to accommodate Paul and Silas, in addition to the people already living in it. Uh, some have speculated that Lydia already had a number of servants in her home. And how did she relate to this good fortune? Did she keep it to herself? No. Luke tells us that she asked Paul and Silas to be her guests. And she actually urged them until they agreed. You know, she was kind of like a good Southern grandma. You know, no, y'all sit down and have a meal. You better sit down until you, you do it, right? In other words, she was hospitable. She was generous with what the Lord had given her, living an open life where people could come in and they could go out and be blessed by her blessings. And it's interesting. One of the sources I read this week said that Lydia's name uh, actually means bending, which uh, the more I thought about it, the more appropriate it sounded uh, because I think bending is the perfect posture to demonstrate hospitality because hospitality requires perfect, perpetual flexibility, doesn't it? A consistent ability to bend to accommodate the people and the circumstances that God presents to us. Uh, I got to be honest, that's a little hard for me. Um, I like my way. Uh, man, I like my schedule. I was reading through this sermon earlier this morning, and Eliza heard that part, and she said, mm-hmm. Uh, I don't do well with last-minute changes in plans, even the ones that I know are those God nudges that you need to follow. That's one of my growing edges, for sure, because I know my life is not my own. My house, my resources, my time, they're not my own. I am blessed to have what I do, and I'm called to be open and hospitable with it, just like Lydia. And while we're on it, I think hospitality, bending in that regard, extends beyond just the physical. I think being hospitable uh, is, is an attitude, and it's one that our world deeply lacks. You don't have to observe our culture too deeply to realize that many of us just aren't all that hospitable to one another. Um, when a person or an idea comes up that doesn't fit our plan, our way of doing things, we don't often bend to make space uh, for that person or idea, even if it's just to listen, uh, which is a shame because we learn things when we make space for other people, when we welcome them into our conversations, our philosophies, our ways of doing things. More importantly, we show them that they matter that they are remarkable, whether we end up agreeing with them or not, at least they know that we've welcomed them. I think we need more of that, more of that Lydia hospitality. Speaking of, we'd be remiss if we didn't mention one more way in which Lydia lived a significant, remarkable life, and that was because she was a woman, and she proves that women get things done. There's an amen. I knew one would come. I didn't even have to ask for it, but I was gonna. Now, in our enlightened 21st century society, it might not seem all that strange that Lydia gets uh, five whole verses of ink in Luke's account of the early church. But believe me, this was pretty big 2,000 years ago. See, women weren't held in very high regard in ancient societies. Their testimony wasn't even admissible in court. They were supposed to be at home, which is why Lydia is so remarkable, because typically women did not hold prominent positions in the community like she did. 
Uh, that's reflected all throughout ancient literature. Of women, the Greek poet Hesiod remarked, do not let a flaunting woman coax and cozen and deceive you. She is after your barn. Liza has been after my barn ever since we let, met. He's right. Uh, or our beloved Aristotle. Bless his heart. He said, for the first principle of movement, whereby that which comes into being is male, is better and more divine than the material whereby it is female. Whose opinion of Aristotle just went down just a little bit, right? But uh, the Bible, while it certainly had strides to make by today's standards, uh, was revolutionary in its time for its depiction of women. In the Old Testament, women served as judges over all of Israel, like Deborah. Uh, in the New Testament, the first evangelist is a woman, right? The woman at the well who goes sprinting into her hometown to spread the good news about Jesus. Uh, in Matthew's genealogy, in a patriarchal society, when all, when all that mattered was who your daddy, not your mama was, in Matthew's genealogy, women are listed in Jesus' lineage, including Tamar, Rahab, a prostitute, Ruth, Bathsheba, and of course, Mary. The first eyewitnesses to the resurrection were women. And then we have women leaders in the church, like Lydia or the deacon Phoebe, one of Paul's benefactors, who some scholars speculate uh, he might have even entrusted with the, the great task of carrying the letter to the Romans to the church in Rome. So you better believe it. Our faith has had some strong women behind it. And as influential as Paul was, his ministry wouldn't have been what it was without them. And that tradition continues. Friends, you look through the story of uh, this church, as I've been doing in my first couple months here at UBC, or, or, or really any church nearby, and whether they get the printed credit or not, you will find the example of women like Lydia who have been not just noteworthy, but downright essential in making healthy historic congregations like ours what they are today. And that's why I'm proud that UBC is a place that recognizes that our God calls women to positions of service, that God calls women to teach classes even if there are men in the room, that God calls women to roles in leadership like deacon, that God calls women to ordain ministry, to serve as pastors or speakers or youth ministers or whoever God might desire them to be. I'm proud that our church is a place that lets Lydia's and Phoebe's and Allison's and Samantha's and Megan's and Melinda's and Ann Smith's and Dewana Banks's and Dinah Bray's and all sorts of Christian women work because the church, capital C, is best when we let God work through whoever God calls to get things done. Paul might not have been Paul without the help of such women, and we might not be who we are without them either. And so, friends, if you're out there today and you're feeling like your name isn't too remarkable, take heart, because in God's kingdom it is. You've got a good old-fashioned three-point Baptist sermon to prove it, all right? I'm not always a three-points-in-a-poem type of preacher, but today I am, except there's no poem. Uh, you are remarkable. You're remarkable because you're called to be a minister in whatever you do. Whether you've got an ordinary job, you're a student, or you're one of those fun or tired folks who's got no job at all. You have specific opportunities and relationships open to you simply by the nature of what God has called you to do that allow you a unique chance to change lives to make this world better in the name of Jesus. Uh, you're remarkable because you can be hospitable, because God is going to send people your way, people who need you to open your home or your wallet or your family or your testimony or your heart or your mind to them. God has big plans for those people, and your hospitality is a part of making those plans happen. And for the prettier and better smelling half of humans hearing this message, you are remarkable because you're a woman. And God uses you to get things done. Your faith, your kindness, your patience, your vulnerability, your passion, your dedication inspires us all. And your witness deserves recording because the world has lessons to learn from you. The truth is, to God, 
All names are the same size. So whatever yours is, know that it matters. Whether a whole world of people knows it or just a few. To fulfill Jesus' prayer to make this earth as it is in heaven, we need everybody. All the names. The ones that get the attention and the names behind those names too. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, our Lord, our Heavenly Parent, we thank you today for the people that we often speak up in this pulpit, in this sanctuary, in these Sunday school classrooms, the names we're used to hearing in our Christian faith because they've done great things. But God, we also thank you for the unknowable number of names behind those names. And we thank you that every once in a while in Scripture, some of those names get a little bit of the spotlight. Folks like Lydia. God, we thank you for that because the truth is those names are just as important as any of the others. And it's easy in our world to go along with the world's way of seeing things, which is that if your, if your name isn't big, then it doesn't matter. But we know that's not true. And so, God, help us to, one, be grateful for our names, to look at somebody like Lydia and see the huge difference, difference that she makes and how Paul likely would not have... have been him, at least to the fullness that he was, without folks like her. Um, Lydia was huge in helping to start the church in, in Philippi. Without her, would we have a letter to the Philippians? God, we can be, and often are, Lydia's like that, people like that, names like that. And then, Lord, also, as we recognize the importance of our names, help us to look around and recognize the importance of others, because there are so many folks who journey this life and feel that they are so unremarkable. Lord, the gift of this good news that we have in you is that we are all remarkable, remarkable enough that you came and, and, and you lived, you gave your life so that we might see our value in the eyes of God, your desire to be with us. So help us through our words and our actions, the way that we live in love, to show that to other people, to let them know that their name matters. And we ask it in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. And we invite you now to respond to the ways that God has been moving in your life and in your heart uh, to, um, uh, to, 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 you know, just respond. Um, maybe uh, that way is, is to stand up and sing, which we're going to have an opportunity to do in, in sharing this hymn. But uh, maybe you're like Atticus or some of our, our younger friends, and God has put a message on your heart, and you just got to speak it, man. So uh, I'll be down at the front if there's something that you want to share with me, any decisions that you have, or um, maybe you need to uh, offer a prayer to God in your pew or, or just write a note down to someone. Um, I don't know how God's moving, but I'm sure that God is. So uh, share it with us as we stand together and we sing our hymn of response that is printed in your bulletin, hymn number 486, Jesus Calls Us Over the Tumult, hymn 486.
I want to share with you something that I meant to say at the be beginning, and, and I, I just neglected to do so. Uh, but if you're visiting with us today, there is a cool little QR code right there on the uh, bulletin. We would love if you would just scan that, and um, you can let us know that you were here. Give us your email address. We'd love to reach out and, and be in touch. Um, this is especially important now that we're not signing in uh, as we were doing during COVID. So we would love to reach out with you and, and say hello. Uh, also want to share with you uh, some plans coming up for the summer months. I know that uh, UBC has a tradition of um, kind of taking a break from, well, there goes the microphone right there. It's back, baby. Um, of kind of uh, switching things up Sunday school wise in the summer and uh, because you know folks are going in different directions and it's harder to plan on exactly how many are going to be here for Sunday school lessons so we're going to take advantage of that and do something cool with that so during the month of June uh, we are all going to be meeting together whether you are a young one whether you are on the opposite end of ages spectrum uh, we are going to be meeting in the uh, community room and having uh, a time of service together uh, service projects that we can do to help benefit uh, different organizations in our community and uh, they're accessible for, for everybody. Uh, so that will, will be at the regular Sunday school time of uh, 9.45 and uh, we'll run till about 10.30. And so please, please come. This is also a wonderful opportunity. If before COVID you were a regular Sunday school attender and then COVID happened and two years worth of not meeting and then uh, and you've been looking to get back into this groove, here is your on-ramp, man. We would love for you to come because it's also a wonderful intergenerational time together. Uh, July, we're going to have a sermon series, and uh, we will, our Sunday school lessons, again, will all be in one big group of adults. The kids will go and play some games during that month, uh, but all the lessons will connect to that sermon series. And, okay, I'll go ahead and spill it, because I'm really excited about it. If you like Garth Brooks, you're going to like this sermon series. And if you don't like Garth Brooks, one, what's wrong with you? You need to check on your salvation. But, um, <laughs> Two, uh, I, would, I have some listening uh, for, for you uh, to, to, to do because uh, we're going to look and find God and Garth in the month of July, and we're going to have some lessons that are connected to that. And then in August, uh, we'll be all together and sort of learning some lessons together. Uh, going to get to do gentle yoga one week in August, and uh, the motto that week is, if you can breathe, you can do this. Um, that's what Rhonda has assured us, so from young to not so young. Uh, uh, we're going to learn a hymn and sign language one week. So we have lots of fun things basically planned for Sunday school in the summer. We hope that you'll join us for those. Uh, and then that'll start in two weeks here, believe it or not. We're charging along. So uh, grateful to have you today. Thank you, parents and little ones for being here and all those who support them. And as you leave, receive this benediction. Might God bless you as you leave this place with gratitude for your name and the knowledge that it is big in God's eyes and knowledge that you walk forth bearing not only your name but that of Christ himself. So thus you can walk forward with confidence and with strength and with joy and share with others that they can do the same. May God bless you in this way. In Jesus' name, amen. May the peace of Christ go with you. Amen. amen.